Hi everyone, um, welcome to Raccoon Laboratory. Uh, this is our second week of drawing instruction, and today we are going to talk about shadows. Um, I talked a little bit about this on Thursday, um, so this is a repeat of that lesson, but with different examples, um, and I'll probably phrase things differently. Um, so uh, feel free to watch both of them. I think you'll get something out of it, but if you missed the previous one, um, I'm covering a lot of the same material. So what we're doing today uh, is different than last week because I'm going to be using a pencil. Um, and this is a particular pencil because it does not have any wood covering the uh, graphite here. So I like it because it allows me to use the edge as like a full um, drawing tool. Um, and while we're focusing on shadows today, um, I'm actually going to encourage you to try to avoid drawing lines where we are not going to be really focusing on uh, the outlines of objects. We're not really delineating um, the divisions between parts. We're more focused on uh, learning to see the shapes of shadows as they appear to us um, on on our objects and uh, I want to highlight the the weirdness the kind of counterintuitive nature of putting a bunch of graphite down as a way of noting something that is not there because a shadow is an absence of light so what we're doing with our pencil is actually bringing our attention to something that is less present for us visually than if we were, say, using a white pencil on black paper. So um, I hope that doesn't complicate things for you. I, I just think it's interesting. Um, for some folks, it, drawing is really intuitive, but um, for many people, drawing isn't. Um, and I think this might be one of the reasons why, uh, because we really are, um, like I often say, imposing our ideas upon what we see instead of just taking them in for what they are. And I think that counterintuitive um, paying attention to something that's missing is part of that. It's, it's, it's hard to draw your attention towards shadows. Um, and so one way I, th I think it might be helpful to think about it, um, and this is actually related to how I learned to play music in high school, um, maybe in a kind of around the corner, indirect way. Um, I want you to think about your paper, uh, whatever kind of paper you're using, um, as being light. So when you, look at your, when you look at your paper, the reason it appears to be white is because light is bouncing off of it into your eyes, right? I think everybody knows that, but we don't really think about it as we go about our day. So what you're doing with the graphite is you're actually blocking light from reaching your eyes. Um, and you're essentially doing the same thing that shadows uh, demonstrate in an object, right? Because a shaded area of an object is an area that is blocked off. It's an area that light can't bounce off into your eyes. At least it's not bouncing off into your eyes um, as much as it could be, right? So when we're thinking about shadows, um, we're thinking about negation. We're thinking about um, we're thinking about sort of like open uh, space as opposed to uh, a present reflective surface, uh, if that makes sense. So this can be really tricky. This can be a tricky way to draw because um, basically, I'm asking you to think about um, to think about what we normally describe as negative space or as detail or texture or color as its own shape. So I want you to think about this shadow behind the WD-40 can here, this little cast shadow, as its own shape. It has a shape. It has edges. It gets darker and it gets lighter. Um, the same is true of this shadow that goes down the edge of the can, right? Because the light is over here the light is falling towards our object, and as we, and as the surface of the can rotates away from us, right, like as we follow the surface of the can around, it starts to um, fall into shadow because it's obscured from the light. 
So I want you to think about that phenomenon as its own object. We are rendering the shadows directly, and then the object will appear in the negative space of the shadows that we are drawing. Now, I hope I'm not overcomplicating this for all of you. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to start drawing this WD-40 can. Um, this is going to be a relatively quick drawing, um, but I'll show you what I mean. So let's get a fresh page here. Okay, so I'm going to start, I think, with that bottom edge because we've got a nice shaded line that I'm not inventing. There is a clear shadow underneath the bottom of that can, so that's convenient for us. And then I'm going to use the edge of my pencil, the whole side of it. You can do this with a crayon, you can do this with chalk. You can really do this with anything that has a flat edge and responds to pressure. You can't, it's, it's hard to do with a pen. I've, uh, I've done lessons before here um, showing like a cross hatching technique, which is basically a combination of lines that make it appear as if we have a shadow um, blocked out. But I think it's easier to think about shadows if you just have, um, if you can cover a bigger surface area with your graphite faster. I think that works a little bit better. Okay, so notice what, what I've done already in trying to draw this shadow here is this edge has been marked because I left it light. Do you guys see that? So we can already see where the can starts because the edge of the can is where the shadow begins. So by drawing the shadow, we are also inadvertently drawing the can. So I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. And you can tell I've got two lights going because this thing's got two shadows. Maybe I'll do a drawing in the future where um, I never actually draw the thing <laughs> that I'm drawing and we just uh, do a really clear drawing of the background. I think that would be fun. And then you kind of have to figure out what you're looking at. Because I like this drawing by absence. I think it's kind of interesting. And so right now I'm rendering that, that back edge, the horizon line on the edge of the wooden box that I put all of these objects onto. And that helps us keep track of the can. And you can see, even though I haven't rendered the can, it does make sense to your eye. Your eye completes this edge mentally. Your, your eye like pretty quickly understands that you're looking at a line going behind an object that's continuous because the object is continuous from this shape to this shape and from this shape to this shape. So especially once we start um, adding shadows to the object itself, it's going to become pretty obvious that you're looking at something that's in front of shadows. Okay, so now I just want to make sure I can judge this distance right. I'm trying to avoid drawing much detail in the label just because, uh, you know, we've talked about this before. I feel like it sort of, um, I feel like it sort of distracts us from the actual make makeup of the object. I feel like we get focused on the graphic design, we get focused on the lettering, we get focused on the legibility of the label. Um, and that's just not what the focus of this lesson is. It's kind of beside the point for me here. So I might do a little bit of it, but it's not really what I want to focus on here. So I kind of got that spray straw drawn in, and now I'm working on the, the kind of wild mechanism 
at the top. It's got lots of weird parts. The other nice thing about using the side of your pencil is that it's easy to switch between having a really, um, a really tight line and a really broad line. I think that helps. So again, I'm leaving out that straw by negation. I'm just implying that it's there. I'm not actually rendering it, and I'm not actually drawing an outline of it. OK, so now we're going to go up here. We've got this shape here. is probably the darkest part of the whole object because we're actually looking at the underside of something. Um, you can kind of see it. My perspective is a little bit different than the camera's, but you can see uh, right here, I think it's the darkest part because it's casting a literal um, a shadow downward, I think, which is it's just darker than anything else. So as you're trying this with an object that's in front of you, I really want you to pay attention to the shadows on their own terms. I want you to think about the shapes that the shadows are making. And don't worry so much about the shape of the object that you want to emerge eventually. Um, it'll show up if your shadows are accurate. If you can just focus on the shadows, the object will appear. So I'm just going to put a line here. All right, and then I'm going to start to uh, show that WD-40 logo very lightly, not focusing on it, not belaboring it, just just darkening the space around that bright yellow logo. And you can see how like with the ukulele last week, there's something really satisfying about the alternation between a light spot, a light spot and a dark spot, a light spot and a dark spot, a light spot and a dark spot. It's kind of like a checkerboard pattern. Um, and because even though the colors are changing, or rather the position of the shades are changing, um, this line stays consistent throughout on the edge of the WD-40 can. So then your brain just completes the dots. You just understand that you're looking at a continuous object. It doesn't actually um, take much brain power to understand that. So uh, the object is implied by what you're seeing. I'm starting to go a little darker here, just to get that edge right. Okay, so now I'm just going to add a little shading to the bottom here, probably complete the far side, and then call it done. 
I'd like to do a future episode where I maybe spend the whole time on one drawing because I would love to show you guys a very carefully made finished drawing. I know I'm I'm often um, doing these kinds of quick sketches or these one-off demonstrations um, and this is actually how I like to draw. I, um, I don't tend to um, put a lot of time into my drawings. I like to draw for drawing's sake more than more than I like um, drawing to uh, to to make completed, really fine drawings. I think I'm just more interested in the act itself. I like what it does for my brain. I like what I learn, and then every now and then I'll need to make something like an album cover or something that needs to have a really nice illustration. So then I'll spend a lot of time on it um, because it's important, but. Most of the time, my practice doesn't really demand super tight drawings. Okay, so actually, this is this is maybe kind of interesting. Uh, so I'm trying to I'm trying to delineate the edge just to the left of this red straw because it's much darker over there, right? But I'm right-handed. I actually I can't really draw with my left hand, and so what that means for me is that the way I hold my pencil, I can't really hold it this way. It's um, really uncomfortable to do that. So um, I'm going to use the pencil vertically to get that line, even though ideally I would actually just use it, I would tilt it the other way. It's just really uncomfortable. So if you're left-handed, um, you might actually have a better time getting a, a shape like this. And I, I once... Um, went into Clifford Still's archives. Uh, they're in downtown Denver, Colorado. I used to live there. And uh, the Clifford Still Museum was gracious enough to let me look through his old drawings. Um, and I think his paintings are interesting. They're, they kind of look like wood grain or something. Um, but his drawings, uh, especially as a student, are beautiful, like really, uh, really interesting kind of uh, they just slowly fade into abstraction as he gets older. But I found that his brush strokes are so consistently um, asymmetrical in the sense that I, I think one of, the, one of the strongest characteristics of some um, abstract expressionist painters are just the fact that they're right-handed, <laughs> you know, because you can only hold a brush in certain ways. And it's funny, like, they're very creative about a lot of things, and then there's this like clear mechanical limit on the choices that um, some painters make just because they, they hold the brush the same way every time. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting. I like learned that by looking at his drawings like uh, and his, his early paintings that were maybe less abstract. I was like, oh, this guy, his work is defined by the fact that he's right-handed more than anything else. I, I don't mean to be reductive. I, maybe I'm selling it short. I'm just saying I thought that was interesting. I never, I've never heard anybody talk about that before. So, I, so I made a note of it. One of the things I love about reflective metal surfaces uh, is like this right here where, I don't know if you can see, but there's a strip on the WD-40 can where the label comes around and then the two sides don't quite meet up. And so there's bare, I assume it's aluminum or steel, exposed between the two halves of the label. And the metal is reflecting the white color of the box that it's sitting on. And so I tried to show that in my drawing a little bit. So it actually gets darker as it goes higher and then starts to reflect the white underneath it. That's one of the things that can, um, that can show you that something's made out of metal if it has like a gradient of reflection in it. Um, whereas glass often has um, much, more, much more harsh 
reflect its shapes. So it'll have, you know, a, uh, like a line from a fluorescent light bulb or like a square from a window or something. Whereas I think metal, it diffuses the reflections a little bit more, like the reflections are a little more gradual. They're a little, they're a little hazier. Um, so in a drawing, you can actually often tell whether something is made out of glass or like is highly polished as opposed to um, it being just like a vaguely reflective metal. Okay, so <clears throat> moving on, we're actually going to do more metal. So I found this staple gun that I'm really excited about. And so I'm going to draw this reflective object. Um, I would uh, love it if you follow along with this. I know I've noticed that some people are actually drawing the objects that I am drawing in my video uh, that people are drawing from their perspective watching. So like they'll draw what's on the screen. That's totally fine if you want to do that. Um, I will say that you will get more out of these exercises if you are drawing something different than me that is in front of you. Uh, translating something from three dimensions into two dimensions is really different than translating something from one two-dimensional plane, the screen, to your paper. It's still good practice, um, but I think drawing something from three dimensions has more, it has more to teach you about your perspective, basically, about how your brain processes information and how your eyes um, see, <laughs> um, especially because, you know, we have stereoscopic vision. And what that means is that we're constantly seeing two images simultaneously. It's like how if you uh, close one of your eyes and then close the other one, all the objects in front of you dance. That's because you're seeing them from two different perspectives at once. And we rarely think about that fact um, going through our lives, right? But when you're sitting in one place and you're drawing something, it can actually be really important. If you Let's say you have a habit of squinting with one eye, and then you get tired, and then you sort of squint with the other while you're drawing. Um, I know some people do this when they take pictures. They'll uh, close one eye and then take photographs, right? Um, then the perspective from which you're observing the object that you're drawing has actually changed, which means that the object has shifted, which means that your drawing is wrong now. <laughs> um, the perspectives that you set up in your drawing won't align with what you're seeing anymore. Um, so anyway, you don't really have to worry about any of that stuff when you're looking at a two-dimensional image. What you're looking at is it's already been flattened for you. It takes care of all that, all that uh, mental processing. So, okay, I am going to draw this object. Uh, I would love it if you drew an object that has some reflections uh, because then uh, I just think it makes the shadows a little more interesting. If that seems intimidating, don't bother. Um, everything has shadows. All shadows can be fascinating to try to draw. So you can see what I was describing earlier in the reflectivity of the metal. You can see here that it's reflecting the it's reflecting the base that it's sitting on and then the edge of the base is here is reflected here so it actually gets darker as it goes up. Um, really weird looking it's actually going to be pretty hard to draw that accurately but I'm just going to try and um, yeah, a number of things are interesting about this. So like you can see you can see here the bottom edge of the handle is super light because it's reflecting light up from underneath it. So now in this case, um, our object reverses many of the things that we were trying to do before, right? The the surface of the object is darker than its edges. Its edges are white and the object is gray-ish. It's just like a dark, uh, yeah, like a dark gray color. So we don't have time to do a super tight drawing of this or anything. I'm not going to worry about that, but I am going to try and uh, render it according to the, to the blobs of darkness that make it up. Um, so we are going to render it according to the light that is not there, as opposed to focusing on uh, the present surfaces, if that makes sense. So I'm going to start with the shadow off to the side of it, just like before. Oop, that was an accident. 
and now I am committed to it. You should make big mistakes and commit to them. <laughs> because it's just a drawing. I think it's better to make bold mistakes than to timidly uh, try and get everything perfect. You can adjust to your mistakes. I think that's something that I really learned um, from blowing glass. I think as a glass blower, you just have to get used to the fact that your glass is going to break. And it doesn't matter how good you are, it doesn't matter how long you spend on it, um, sometimes your glass is going to break. You just have to get used to it. And if you're too precious about it, you're going to be unhappy. <laughs> This really dark, uh, like rubber guard on the handle here that I'm trying to show. And then I'm marking the rivets that hold the object together um, because they're important details, but also because it helps me keep track of where I am in the drawing. This is something I'll probably talk about a lot, but I feel like it's really easy to get lost in a drawing, to kind of lose track of where your pencil was, what you were working on, get confused. It can be hard to judge distances. Like, is the distance from this corner to this corner really the same as the distance from this corner to this corner? I don't know. It looks pretty close to me, but it's kind of hard to tell. And I think that's where contour drawing can come in to really help you because you can get the hang of really following a line. And it's not what we're doing today, but it's why I think it's so helpful. So here the rivet is much lighter than the surrounding handle. This feels more like painting, working this way. And yeah, it turns out I think I went way above where I needed to go. So I'm going to use my eraser. I talked about this a little bit on Thursday, but this is a Utrecht gummy eraser. They're super cheap. I like them because they don't uh, smear the graphite all that much. Uh, they clean the graphite off the page, and I use them mostly. Um, I use them mostly to clean up paper, uh, to clean up pencil from inked edges when I'm illustrating something like a poster or if I'm making a comic. Um, a lot of my work sometimes I'll. Uh, lay stuff out in pencil, ink it with uh, India ink, and then erase the pencil underneath. And so I like using this eraser for that, so I have it around. Um, I think it's a lot nicer than those pink um, pink pearl erasers that they're like the, the classic like school eraser. Um, I find that those really do smear graphite around, so I don't trust them. Plus they don't last that long. They get hard and weird after a certain amount of time. So 
So now I'm just trying to show that darker reflection. Unfortunately for us, I don't really see a way that this is not going to make the object harder to understand. So we're going to have to work really hard with our gradients to imply the edges of the object. And you can see how what I mean by gradient is I'm kind of I'm fading the graphite in. Even though it is kind of a hard edge reflection here, and it's a little bit higher from my perspective um, on the object because I'm sitting a little bit lower than the camera, um, this, this edge is not perfectly straight. It's diffused. You can see there's kind of a transition period in here, and that's what I'm trying to emphasize. Um, I'm trying to emphasize that, that gradation, and that allows us to it allows us to just explain where the surfaces start and stop to whoever is looking at our drawing. So what I'll often do when I'm making a gradient is I'll start with a really dark edge and then I'll kind of fade it into my lighter, more general uh, tone, which you can see that I've done here from the corner down and from this curved edge up. It kind of helps draw the eye towards the edges. It helps the eye understand that it's looking at a surface that has an edge. So I think I just did what I often tell you guys not to do, which is I got totally distracted by a detail because I was interested in it. Um, I wanted to talk about it, wanted to demonstrate it, but you can see I didn't really finish my whole uh, outline of the object. Like I don't have much information in here at all. I let this get really dark. I haven't drawn the knob on the back here. Um, and now I'm having to sort of rethink how I approached it. I'm like, oh, did I, is it too dark? Is it just all going to look like a washed out gray blob, which I suspect that it might. Um, so this is why I will often tell you to try to work the whole page. It's really important. Um, if you get too caught up in something, you're going to lose sight of what is, uh, what is needed to make your drawing work. So I'm going to get a little bit looser with it. I think that's going to help. I already like that better. Okay, so you can kind of see it. It's like a, it's a little washed out, it's a little fuzzy, but we didn't put any outlines into this drawing and you can really see that this is a staple gun in space. I think it looks pretty clearly like the thing that it's meant to evoke. And that's just because we have these contrasting colors 
not really colors, I should say shades, um, right next to each other that imply the presence of the object, right? Um, this is going to be a really useful tool for you because in the future we're going to cover um, how to combine these ideas. So when you're not just doing an exercise, but you're trying to do a really nice drawing or even a painting, you can use a combination of edges and uh, sort of like shaded in shapes to show reflections, contours, shadows, and edges uh, like actual conceptual divisions between parts, between objects. Um, you know, the difference between uh, a thing and the space that it's in. Um, you now have many, many tools with, with which to make those distinctions, right? Are you going to imply the difference between two surfaces or are you going to make it explicit? Um, and there are even artists that will combine these approaches. So one of the things that I, um, that I really admire about uh, Japanese animation, like anime, is that the backgrounds are often hand painted and the backgrounds often feature these lush um, like watercolor or gouache paintings. Um, I'm sure they're all digital now, but um, the backgrounds are, are often vividly painted and then the characters have hard outlines and then blocky colors. And what's interesting about that is it causes the environments to look more or less real, but they don't draw as much attention to the brain, to the viewer, as the characters do, because the characters have these clear black outlines, and the things that matter conceptually about the characters are clearly shown to you um, almost as symbols. So this is an idea we're going to get into next week, the idea of um, sort of switching gears between uh, observational, clearly seeing what's in front of you, and more symbolic, almost linguistic, demonstrating or um, like telling your audience what you want them to think is important. So then uh, that that's something uh, that's closer to, you know, if I was trying to draw a can of WD-40 in a cartoon, I wouldn't worry about the shading on the on the can. I wouldn't worry so much about implying the presence of the can from the shadows behind it. That's all very nuanced. It's all very spacious. Um, and it, I think in some ways is really elegant. But if I wanted to clearly communicate this is a drawing of a can of WD-40, I would draw a cylinder and then write the words WD-40 on it because then it would be more clear to the people looking at the cartoon what they were meant to understand, right? Um, so that's a totally different kind of drawing, um, and I bring it up in some ways just to contrast it to what we're doing here. I think drawing like that is more like communication. It's more, uh, it's more like illustration. It's more analytical, and you're employing your linguistic brain to communicate clearly. This is much different than that. Um, we're really learning to see what's in front of us, to take it in, and eliminate the things that are in between us and the thing we're drawing. We just want to uh, we just want to be able to perfectly replicate it without really um, having to think about it. Um, of course, that's a that's an ideal. It's like a romantic ideal or something. But I think the closer we can get to it, often the better our drawings will be. And then if you're really if you really love drawing and you draw in situations where you need to communicate clearly, you will find that many of the tools that you learn through observational drawing make your drawings seem more real because you can you can use implication you can use shadows you can um, withhold edges where other artists might just clearly outline something you can um, you can use these subtle observations about the world to communicate your perspective to your audience and they might not know that they're picking those things up but they are taking them in um, so anyway uh, that's what I wanted to talk about today. I've only got a few more minutes, so I think I am going to cut this short. But um, I, I just wanted to thank everybody for, uh, for watching, for tuning in. I hope you're getting something out of these drawing lessons. And please keep sending me your drawings. I love receiving these drawings. Um, folks have been tagging Firebird Community Arts in Instagram posts and posting their drawings. That is like so wonderful because I get to see them and then it also shows people um, that you're following along with the show and that you're learning from it. Um, that's like really wonderful. 
Um, and if you'd like, I'll probably start featuring drawings from people who are uh, watching. So I will never do that without your permission. So don't be afraid like to send me something that I'm going to put it on YouTube. Um, but if you are willing to share, I would love to show drawings, especially after um, we've done this for like a few weeks and um, everybody's getting better. Um, I think that would be really wonderful and exciting. So as I've been doing, uh, as I did last week and we're gonna do every week, we are featuring a nonprofit that is doing good work in our neighborhood on the west side. Um, CPS, CPS basically was ordered to cancel its public lunch program um, after the protests uh, about a month ago. Um, it's since been reinstated, but pretty immediately, thankful for Chicago, stepped up and started providing food to people in Englewood and in Garfield Park, and they are continuing their um, nonprofit work uh, indefinitely and so they're accepting donations i've included thankful for chicago in the description of this video um, if you want to help out this neighborhood is uh is in need and uh, please please donate they're a great organization um, and i totally stand by what they do uh, so yeah thank you so much for watching please support firebird community arts they're great for letting me do this um, and get in touch with me if you have any questions or if there's something you'd like to see more of or something you'd like to see less of um, I really appreciate it. Okay, thanks.